Okay, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, so I, I'm a theoretical chemist and I feel that I have not really done anything on solar cells before. I thought, I haven't done any research, but I actually taught on a summer school in Copenhagen on exploiting solar energy. And I can see that they have a, like a similar approach there. I mean, they have put three depart groups together in, in chemistry, modeling, with Kurt Mikkelsen, that was my postdoc advisor. Uh, the Nielsen, Mogens Brunstad Nielsen doing organic synthesis. But they also have a strong group in spectroscopy with Henrik Kjergaard leading. And I guess that uh, aspect is still a little bit missing here. There. The strong Raman spectroscopy, for example, to analyze the excited states. The fate, they're all interested in excited states, but what's the fate of the excited states when they excited the electron? Yeah. Uh, what I would do is to give a a little bit general overview of what I'm doing first. So I will start by listing one slide on different projects that I'm, I'm working on at the moment. And then I will pinpoint on one single method that I'm working on and try to explain what that is. Uh, my major project for the last 10 years has been, been so I'm on my fifth PhD student working on electrical insulation, insulating liquids, transformer oils, that's the application. And if you go into that field, and that's, that is how does a liquid resist electric fields. Uh, if you go into that kind of modeling, I can see, particularly if you then go from liquids to cables, polymer cables, then the same kind of modeling, whole trans transport of holes, transport of electrons, are the same kind of modeling that you would like to have here. Now, it's not the kind of modeling I've been doing, but I can see some similarities there. So to understand why some liquids break down faster than others in electric fields, and that is something we have worked on. That's something we work on with Synthetic Energy here in Trondheim, with ABB Corporate Research in Westeros, and with uh, and uh, then us at NTNU there. So another product I also worked on for many years, that is with the Shen in the Catalysis Group here at NTNU on now on fischer tropsch catalysis, but his idea is to work on metal atoms or metal clusters on carbon surfaces. And these here are very similar carbon structures that at least some of you talked about, where you have uh, highly conjugated surfaces. And they interact strongly with metal atoms. I mean, they, and how to tune that properties to improve the catalytic activity of the dimers or single atoms. That is something that we worked on quite a bit there. And that is then a pure a DFT project or TFT based project now. But we also used uh, reactive force fields, the REACT force fields, some years ago there on to, to model this. Uh, a third project is on chirality and optical rotation. And uh, uh, Shoko has done some calculations both with Bordhoff and with Odreida uh, Gauton here. We have some publications together. Uh, so that is also not only DFT calculations, time-dependent DFT calculations, but also calibrations with couple cluster. We have an expert in couple cluster in Henrik Koch in our group there. Uh, the one to relate that to the kind of force field model, that is, she also done some work there, and that's what I will talk about in this lecture. So I will not really talk about these calculations now. The fourth project, and I can see that the Imperial College has been mentioned quite a bit here, and we also have another professor, too, from Imperial College, that's Fernando Bresme. And uh, he managed to get a, a project at the Research Council on th what's called thermomolecular orientation of molecules. And that is his research interest. So if you apply a, a temperature gradient on a liquid, on a, let's say water, the heavy part would like to be in the cold region and the light part would like to be in the hot region. Which means that you orient the water molecules and if you orient polar molecules, you get an electric field, and that you can measure. Uh, what we try to do here, so that's a molecular simulation project, and we have Ulf Österberg that's doing terahertz spectroscopy with a postdoc in that project. And uh, so the idea here is to combine these simulations with, for example, experiments doing the optical care effect and things like that to characterize that. That effect has only been seen in simulations so far, and but to find an experimental method to detect that 
And I think we think that an optical, the optical care effect will be the ideal way to do it. Problem is to locally have a temperature gradient in the system, because how do you apply that experimentally? How do you, how do you do that? You can do it, you can excite vibrationally molecules, and then they would emit heat, and that would give a temperature gradient, but that would be radially around the molecules, not linearly across the system. So it's not easy, but we hope that we have some experimental expertise within the project to do that. So that was a little bit the summary. Now I will come to the actual model that I will talk about, and that's a classical. I did my PhD in Lund with Gunnar Karlström on polarizable force fields. So we worked on, on like polar, classical force fields that we parameterized from quantum chemistry, and then we used them in simulations or in other types of models. And that is essentially what I worked with all my time. And so I use quantum chemistry as a, as a method to test or parameterize, let's say, more classical models. And that is what I will try to explain a little bit. So, I will not provide a lot. I, I need to apologize because I have a lot, some equations in the slides. What I will do is to talk like about the first line and try to explain that and not go through the rest. And I have some slides like that. I didn't have the energy and patience to redo the slides. Uh, the model that we work, that is, we represent each atom in the system, for example, by a point polarizability. That means if you apply the field to the system, each particle is induced, get an induced type of moment. They in turn induce the rest of the system, and you get a set of coupled equations. That means, so when an induced type of moment of one atom, that's the polarizability times the applied field, plus the field of all other atoms in the systems. Uh, so if you solve that analytically, and also here only talk about the first equations for a two-atom system, it means that if the atoms come close to each other, then the field will be very large on the other one, and you get the divergence in the system. We use that, I mean, when we, when we do time-dependent DFT to calculate excited states there, then we don't do a calculation on the ground state and on the excited state. What we do is to look on the polarizability and see where that diverges. Because the divergences of the polarizability, that is where we have the excitations. So that kind of model, that gives exactly the same system that we have. You have divergences here that gives the model dependences. So we then, so these are parameters and the alphas here are parameters, and these are then the results that we get out from the model. So I then fit these parameters to quantum chemical data, and then I use rather simple expressions to do this there. And that is a method already by Silberstein in 1917. He didn't use it for polarization, he used it for optical rotation. So that is was what it came from there, originally. There's a very similar model called electronegativity equalization. That has not to do with polaris polarizabilities, that has to do with charge transfer between particles in the system. So if two atoms have different electronegativities, charge will move from one atom to the other until the electronegativity is the same everywhere. So the, the, the interpretation of electronegativity is that the chemi put chemical potential for electrons. If you think about it in terms of, of uh, thermodynamics instead, particles will move around, so the concentration is the same everywhere, or we have the same chemical potential everywhere. So there are also very simple models to do ch look on charge transfer systems where we have an electronegativity, an applied potential, and the charges. We have what's called a chemical hardness or an atomic capacitance that it's the work for, for a particle to be charged in a system. And then we have the Coulomb's law, and we have a constraint that the charge is conserved in the system, because we, we don't add or remove charges. So that is the kind of models that we try to parameterize. Also here it's instructive to solve the two-particle system, and then we see that it's a difference in electronegativity, difference in applied potential that gives the charge transfer between two atoms. Also here we have divergences. 
when these two, all these val all these numbers, all these all these are positive numbers, so there is a positive minus another positive, so that may be zero there, and you again get the divergence where you have an excitation there. Now we have reworked this model quite a bit because it is from the start a metallic model. It only works for metallic systems, but I will not go through that kind of method development. So the summary of our model is that we have a, what we call a charge transfer model, we have a point dipole interaction model, it's a polarizability model, and then we also have a coupling between the, the charges and dipoles, and that we solve. So mathematically, that is a 4n times 4n linear problem to be solved, and that is of course much, much faster than to do a DFT calculation on a molecule. So let's take a simple example, what's the first thing we did, was that we took a, a polyene and an alkane chain. So this is then the dipole moment of the system, and this is then the number of carbon atoms in the system. Now, if you just did that, the dipole moment would be zero, so we just put an aldehyde at the end of the chain to see that we actually had a dipole moment. The dipole moment of the polyene, that increases quite a bit with around a factor of three to four when you increase the length of the chain. Because charge, if you make the chain longer, the, the charge is moving further and further away. And whereas the alkane, then it's almost constant. It's the, the electrons, the, the polar groups are still in, just in the end of the chain. We model that with only one type of carbon parameters. And what we actually do is that we, these charge transfer terms that we have, they depend on the bond distance. So what we say is that it's the bond, dis the bond distance that determines the amount of charge transport in the system. Now it's a function of the bond distance, so that could look a little strange, but that's how it works. And that worked fine, and we also then tried, I asked a question on the first lecture on our scenes, and that is also a system that we tried. But we run into problems when we did uh, graphene nanoflakes in two dimensions. Because then the polarization in the armchair direction and in the zigzag direction, that's not the same because the carbon structures go in the different ways. We got one direction correct, but the other one was wrong. We couldn't understand why. And then we realized that if you, if you then look on how the electrons would travel through bonds, there's a bond length in one of the directions that is, uh, that is not in the training set. There's one bond length that's a little bit longer than we're used to, and that was not parameterized correctly. So, so uh, we, we really believe that if you would like to understand, one way to understand why charge transport is different in, in different systems, that is to look on the longest bond length where, it, where the transport has to go. That would tell you a lot there. So we just included that bond properly in the, in the model, then we also got good results for that type of systems. Now. Uh, Yes, briefly. Then what we did then was to extend it to a time-dependent model. And then you can do response theory and so on, and you get frequency-dependent properties. I will not go through that in detail, but we just essentially put time-dependent charges and time-dependent dipole moments. I dropped that one. What you see then is that we get the poles of the polarizability in this model. That gives us the excitation energies in the system. So it means that excitations is not really a quantum property, so to speak. It's, it's just enough to have a polarizability model that diverges at certain points. That gives the, the excitations. Uh, there's a parameter epsilon here that in, an, in a purely metallic model that would be zero, which means that you have a degenerate system, there. Whereas, whereas it's one for a purely insulating system, and that is that parameter that we worked quite a bit on to, to understand. So you have excitations that depend on that charge transfer terms diverges, and you have excitation energies that depend on the dipole, the point, the point uh, dipole moments diverges, so they become infinitely large now. 
So we parameterized this model and looked, so first we looked on Atsub and Sense because I, when I was at the research, that was one of the systems that was of interest there for optical materials. So I have some quite experience from that. We extended the model with the lifetime of the excited state. And that includes an imaginary part of the frequency. And that means that we get the complex polarizability out. We don't only have the real part, but we also have the imaginary part. The, the points here, so all the, the blue curves, that is in the real part of the polarizability, and the red part is that's the imaginary part of the polarizability. The dots are DFT calculations and the lines that is our model there. Now these are systems that we fitted to, so it's not strange that we, we can parameterize them quite well there. The, these are different scales, so this is atsubenzene, but we can compare to the benzene molecule. You have to see that we can, well we get actually get the local, we get here an excitation in the right region and we get it localized to the ATSO bond in the system. Whereas here then we get an excitation in the aromatic system. If we instead compare ATSO benzene with where we had put uh, uh, amino groups on the para positions on the ATSO benzene. So what you do then is you put, you, you, you put groups at the end of the molecules, but the excitation is in the middle. That is, so you put donor acceptor contributions here and then you get a short transfer either to or from these end groups from the middle. So that should be like a challenging system to be able to model because we would like to have these short transfer effects correct to get the excitation energy correct in the middle. And you can see here that we get the imaginary part then that's the peak here is around the excitation energy and that shift, now we have the same scales here, so we get that shift correct when we do these models. And we did that for like 20 different types of substitutions and we only one of them substitutions gave us problems and we don't really understand why. But again that has to do with that you, you introduce some some bond lengths in some groups that we can't really model the shot transfer in. That is when we, we run into problems there. So it means that we have a model for the for the complex polarizability and in principle and also for the absorption spectrum of the, of the system there. Now we only done parameterizations through the pi to pi star excitation here. So we don't have in a way included higher order excitations so far. So next step we did and then I only sketched the equations again. That is to look on local field corrections. Uh, and that is, we're interested in that, particularly in the electrical insulation project, because if you apply a field to a system, that doesn't mean that is, that's the field that the molecule in the liquid or in the system experiences, because the local field will be different. So the local field at the point K, that's the applied field, plus the field from all the charges and from all the dipole moments. Now we don't compute that, we compute what's called a local field factor. So we take the derivative of the local field respect to the applied field. So that is just a number, it's 10 for example. If it's 10 it means that the local field is 10 times larger than the applied field. And in some systems you would like to have that. If you for example do surface enhanced drama spectroscopy, then you would like to have have large field factors because that would increase the Raman signal. If you have an electrical insulation material, you would, you would don't want it. Then you do because high local fields may then gi give ionization and breakdown on the liquid. That depends on what you are interested in. But if one is doing these derivations, then one can see that the, the properties that we get out here, they are exactly the same properties that we need to get the polarizability. So we just restructured the equations a little bit, solve the same numerical problem, and we get a different property out. And yeah, we did some tests on the benzene. Let's move on. Uh, so, uh, so a system that we then applied this to was to the liquid benzene, where we then take one molecule out. We look at one molecule in the middle, where we look on the local field effects and then we cut out a structure around that when we include all these molecules here. And we sample around 500 of these from molecular dynamic simulations there. Uh, 
We are not really interested in, in averages here. We're interested in the highest possible values. I mean, what are the largest possible uh, uh, local fields that you can have? Because breakdown in a liquid, that is a rare event. In a transformer, you may wa wait for 50 years, so we can't wait that long, but when it happens, it's serious there. Yeah. So, now that was not that exciting in liquid benzene, so these are then different atoms and it's different components. And the largest local field factors that we get, that's around six. And that is quite a bit. But it should be possible, if I talk to, I spent a sabbatical with Mark Ratner and George Schatz at Northwestern, George Schatz has worked quite a bit on, on this. And he would say that he would, he would like to get up to a factor of 10 to 12. That is the, where we have, should have the largest local field factors in, in molecular systems. Uh, the reason for that is that when it comes to local field factors, the charge and dipole terms, they can either, either add up or they can cancel each other. They have positive and negative signs. And for, for benzene, they actually cancel each other. Whereas if we had done azobenzene instead, then they would have been added up. And then we probably would have received larger effects there. Uh, some time ago, when I was in Copenhagen with Lasse Jensen, that is now uh, associate professor at Penn State, and Ms. Kurt Mikkelsen, that is, was my postdoc advisor, we also extended this model to, uh, to the dielectric constant, or to the dielectric relaxation, uh, using an extension of what's called a lorentz lorentz or clausius mosotti model. Where we then, uh, uh, and what we get out there is then the frequency dependent dielectric constant, but it's only the electronic part. If some of you take liquid water, you would have other contributions from uh, vibrations, and you would have from the reorientations of the system, which for liquid water would be the major contributions. So the, the electronic part, or the, what you call the, uh, the, the optical part, that is only around a factor, that's only around two. But we then see that we then get a sudden increase at an excitation energy, and we also get the complex or the imaginary part of the dielectric constant like this now. So it's also a model then to get dielectric properties out. And that is, of course, of interest in systems where we would like to have charge separation. Because if you would like to have charge separation in a system, the dielectric constant sheets the electrostatic interactions. And another, pr not the project with ABB, but a something that we discussed to do is that we know that they are interested in capacitors and they are, you work, work on polymer based capacitors but then you have charge like this but the polymer in between only has an electric constant of two so to charge the capacitor requires a lot of work but if they then add water to the polymer system then they increase the dielectric constant and that work should work better so there's a lot of as a need or then to have like a molecular understanding on, on the electric constants to be able to optimize that for different types of systems. So, so to summarize this, I would like to, what I tried to present is like a distributed polarization model. I didn't talk about much, but it tells you where in the molecule it happens. Because it's a sum of, at so that when we compute the excitation energy, for example, that's the sum of atomic contributions. So we can of course go in and identify where these contributions come from and where that actually uh, uh, what is important. I would suggest and I tr try to do a little bit or, or towards uh, like physical organic chemistry, that's about selectivity. Because you can rephrase these equations so you get reactivity indexes like the Foucault index and that would tell you what it's likely in the molecule to have either a nucleophilic or electrophilic attack. If it works for that, I don't know, but if someone has some interesting systems where one could they then need to compare, I mean, we need a, a sequence of molecules with a different, with a different, there were different results, then that method could be used to that. I was in Copenhagen for a couple of weeks now, and then we worked on a model for the molecular or the conductivity of the system, which is not the same as the mobility of electrons in the system, because <laughs> If you go through, and here I also had a lot of help with uh, 
a professor in quantum optics here at NTNU, Bostudus Gagastam. I mean, if you, are, if you know quantum optics, then you know both quantum, and quantum mechanics and you know electromagnetism. And if you would like to understand the interactions between molecules and electric fields, then it's what you need. But we then managed to derive a relation but actually between the a simple relation between the conductivity and the polarizability that is just the imaginary part of the polarizability times the frequency. So it looks very similar to the expressions you get from the, for the absorption spectra. Uh, we also have some ideas so that we are working on. This is what we are discussing to do in the future. That is Vladimir Mujica in Arizona. And that is to go to mobility of electrons, but then we need to relate this model to the, what we try to do is to, to the rate constants in Marcus theory. We think we can express these rate constants in terms of what I discussed here, but that we, we don't know exactly how that would look like, but we think we have some ideas how to do that. So I hope now with that I explained a little bit what I'm doing and perhaps inspired some of you to think about things also in this direction there. Thank you for attention. Questions? Yes. Thanks. <coughs> uh, yes, uh, when it comes to mobility versus conductivity. So, uh, as I understand the conductivity that you're modeling and talking about is sort of the internal relaxation of the electron cloud, so to speak. Uh, yeah, I mean conductivity, that is, uh, I mean, that has a very clear definition in mm. electromagnetism. That is mm. the current, uh, the current density is the conductivity times the field. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and uh, so I mean that's the only thing you need to get and so that is not what you measure when you measure mobility no. then you measure something else than the yeah. conductivity yeah. Yeah. and it makes sense that conductivity then is the imaginary part it's related to the imaginary part of the polarizability because the imaginary part of the polarizability that's the absorption mm -hmm. no. so, it, so it makes perfect sense but conductivity is then it's, it's essentially if you have a dielectric system with its, uh, which is closed. I mean, you don't allow transport of electrons. You don't have a steady state system where you have transport in and out, but you have a closed system. What happens then is that you excite the electrons up mm -hmm. and they relax, and that is essentially what conductivity would be. Mm -hmm. That's probably not what you're interested in, but if you go back, and that is, I had very long discussions with, for example, Skagerstam on this. Mm -hmm. But he, but now we agree <laughs> that is what conductivity. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. so so yes, so here you just have to know your electromagnetism, <laughs> and then you get mm -hmm. it right there. Mm -hmm. Then uh, no. mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but but when it comes to modeling the uh, polarizability, yeah, uh, uh, I didn't qu quite get the model. So you're basically using polarizability of individual moieties. Is that what you're? Yeah. Atoms. I mean, uh, yeah. so each uh, atom in the system is. Uh, yeah, I divide the systems into subsystems, and each mm. subsystem is an atom. Mm. And each atom I represent with a point polarizability mm. and some electronegativities and so on to, to describe the charge mm. transfer. Mm. Mm. So it's a charge transfer model plus a, an induced dipole system. Mm. So charge transfer, then you describe what is moving from one system to another system. Mm. And with uh, induced dipole, then it's a polarization within each subsystem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But would, would you be able to get a good curve if you also fit using, say, the polarization, no, the, the, the excitation spectrum and, and such things? Uh, well, I mean, uh, yes, yeah, I mean, well, now, yeah, uh, in, in practice, yes. But what we do is that we compute, you can compute the, the polarizability. There, there are methods both in Dalton and in ADF to, co to compute a complex polarizability where we then uh, apply these lifetimes and then you can compute the polarizability as a function of the frequency through the excitation energy. That's another way to do it. And, uh, but then the, the peak there would correspond to where the excitation energy is in time dependent EFT then. I mean, it would be the same points. Questions? 
I have a question. Uh, when it comes to this idea of selectivity and using Fukui indices and so on, um, you look for a data set. We have what we call data sets, like a TLC data set and some other data set where you can test out your indices because they would basically be structured as hippies, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah. but what I'm looking for, I mean, what I looked a little bit at was the, the automata para uh, controlling of substitutions in, 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 in aromatic systems uh, to see how that works. So we need something where we, where we have systems where, I mean, for one structure you get the attack there, for another system you get the attack there, for example, so, and try to get these like, finer details correct there. So, yeah, so I mean it's because uh, 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 essentially well, what happened, I mean it, it should be systems, I mean if we can understand uh, the reactivity in terms of the electrostatic potential around the sites in different molecules are different, not spherical hindrance and so on, that would be other effects. But if it's electrostatic potential that determines it, then this model will work. Any other questions? I'm going to close this session and thank uh, you very much. Close. We have to close this session, sorry. Thank you.